Tonight, we welcome Wes Jones, partner of Jones Partners Architecture, a California-based architectural practice founded in 1993. I am extremely pleased to introduce today's guest, as he is actually one of the reasons I am here. I know Wes Jones since I was a student, when in the early 1990s I bought a book called Architecture of the 20th Century by Tushin. The book was a compilation of the great masters of the 20th century, starting with Art Nouveau, De Stijl, Werkbund, Bauhaus, touching on masters like Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, and Louis Kahn, among many others, and ending with the early and still fairly tame work of a middle-aged Franco Geary, who was just at the brink of becoming famous, as the 20th century was still in full swing at the time. Among the great architects and their avant-garde ideas featured, one project stood out, a young architect's work, subversive and radical, which touched, touched me in a special way. A pop art style drawing of a weird container building that would get delivered to its site via helicopter, besides its conceptuality, the radical approach to architecture and construction, the drawing looked like it had been drawn on a computer, but just way before computers were widely in use. Later I learned about analog techniques and the heavy use of expensive letter set adhesives now long forgotten and unknown to the current gen generation of architecture students. The drawing and its architecture was ultimately fascinating, more than anything in the book, as it promised to look into what the 21st century might have to offer. Since then, I would soak up anything I could get my hands on from West Jones' office and the many people that were influenced by him, forming in my mind a kind of scene here at the California West Coast. I also remember dragging my father out to the Kennedy Space Center, mainly in order to check out Wes Jones' highly acclaimed astronaut memorial. So through the years, I remained a fan, always excited to find new publications and see new projects or build examples of Wes Jones' particular technolog technologically inspired architectural stance that formed the basis for my personal fascination with American architecture. While this was all pre-internet, it was actually easy to get my hands on stuff as his work got more and more published, reflecting his prolific career. His technologically inspired designs for completed buildings and theoretical projects have received acclaim from their critical engagement with the contemporary cultural scene and their disciplinary sophistication. His eight progressive architecture design awards include recognition for the Astronauts Memorial at the Kennedy Space Center and the 180 million South Campus Chiller Plan for UCLA. The work of Jones and Park the work of Jones and Jones Partners Architecture has been featured in countless publications and exhibitions and can be found in the permanent collections of most leading design museums, including the SF MoMA, the Canadian Centre for Architecture and the FRAC Centre in Orléans, France. Princeton Architectural Press has published two monographs uh, on his work, and I think one is, one is in our library here, <laughs> I hope. Um, Instrumental Form and El Segundo and plans underway for a current volume to be titled Alameda, the LF Alameda. The LF Forum has published Meet the Nelsons, a collection of the Jones cartoons from any magazine, and Akhtar has just released Super Green, an analysis through the design of current environmental sensibilities in architecture by the firm and its alumni. A recipient of the Rome Prize in Architecture and Arts and Letters Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Jones was recently named one of the 30 most admired educators in the country in the Design Intelligence Survey of Architectural Education. Jones has written and lectured internationally on technology and the work of the firm and has taught in the schools of architecture at Harvard, Princeton, IIT, Columbia, UCLA, The Ohio State University, SIARC, and now USC. Most recently, he held the Frank Geary Chair at the University of Toronto and Howard Freeman Professor of Practice at UC Berkeley. Jones is a licensed architect in California, Oregon, and New York. He is currently teaching at the School of Architecture of the University of Southern California, where he is serving as the director of the graduate program. We are extremely fortunate to be able to welcome him here, based on a personal connection of Yim Ju, who once was West's classmate at the GSD. Please join me in welcoming Wes Jones. Oh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, San Francisco was, in a way, my old stomping grounds, and so it's great to come back every now and then, although usually I end up coming back and going across the bay to Berkeley. And I think this may be one of the f only times I've actually talked in San Francisco itself, so that's great. So for the last 10 years um, or so, I've been more of an academic um, 
than a practitioner, or at least uh, sometimes it feels that way. Tonight I'd like to approach uh, an explanation of my practice from that direction then. In fact, the typical academic focus on innovation, originality, and creativity often takes architecture's own identity for granted. And so what would ostensibly uh, be the focus of an architectural education and architectural explanation gets overlooked. We often spend our time looking everywhere for inspiration as architects, but the field itself, pursuing uh, critical exercises and interdisciplinary projects without really noticing architecture's real difference from the art, construction, sociology, or biology that frame these challenges. And all the while, we remain secure in our sense of the architectural as a given, stable and sensible, underwriting the confidence with which these adventures that we are taking um, are uh, enjoined. But when the time for explaining what you're doing or why you're doing it rolls around, uh, whether it's a lecture before an audience like you all or a presentation before a skeptical client, then that identity of architecture heretofore taken for granted suddenly becomes an issue. When the props of institutional self-esteem disappear and the vocational crutches of prescribed technique, stipulated methodology, client programs, or mandated software are removed, leaving us then to make our own decisions, it's no longer so obvious what we've been doing as architecture for all that time. Now, I hope you recognize that I'm speaking not necessarily or particularly or exclusively about us, but about architects in general at this point. So then the, the responsible aware architect uh, might ask, perhaps even for the first time, what is this thing, architecture, that I'm supposed to make here? And thus, then, is foregrounded thinking, that most important dimension of architecture and its design, precisely the point when architecture becomes the subject. In fact, the role of thought in the architectural enterprise is in many ways as obscure as the architecture it supports. Walter Benjamin famously pointed out that most architecture is noticed, if at all, in a state of distraction. While it might be argued that he was referring to building more than architecture, it's still true that even the conscious appreciation of architecture favors striking visual effects over solid ideas, and both vocational exercises and stochastic form finding feature more rote production than analysis, usually. Yet, architecture distinguishes itself from building by the degree and character of the thought given to it during design, and inspired in others as they appreciate its realized presence. So whether it is the, um, quote, seeing ahead, end quote, that makes technique a form of wisdom, Aristotle via Heidegger, or what, quote, distinguishes the worst of bees, or the worst architect from the best bee, Marx, architecture has literally embodied thinking since architecture first arose in the West as the difference between the timber construction and its idealized translation into pentelic marble. As a large, expensive presence, architecture is naturally invested with the kind of importance that not only demands attention, but also accrues meaning. Which is to say, architecture signifies at least the tremendous effort that goes into it, indexing its importance with its presence. But it also spins that presence toward justification or celebration. And this is more of an issue today when 
current events, practices, and possibilities in technology and culture are leading architecture to wonder whether thinking provides quite the foundation it has historically assumed. In other words, to a culture increasingly satisfied with virtual experience, sampling the cornucopic haze of digital plenty, where the most influential phenomena are social media and where reality must be augmented to count for anything, and where Benjamin's version of distraction is updated by the effects of texting, tweeting, Googling, and Facebooking, when all this happens, architecture retreats further and further into the thoughtless background. So against this, an architectural idea must then involve both demonstration and exploration, thinking and imagination. It presumes a body of knowledge that can be mastered, as well as room for that body to be enlarged. Though it may wander deep into either territory, it will still retain a connection to the other and invite the assessment to consider both. These two axes of assessment, thinking and imagination, naturally differ in their parameters of judgment. But even the most imaginative creation will raise issues of rigor and the driest demonstration of competence will beg more than merely faithful reproduction. Between all these terms and across these axes then, the architectural proposition claims a territory. It is a principal responsibility of even the most fanciful or exploratory idea to map out this territory in relation to the discipline and larger culture. In fact, it is common to consider disciplinary identity in terms of uh, a, a spatial metaphor, with thinking as sort of getting around within the space and innovation then as pushing the envelope, the edges of that space. Architecture then, within this metaphor, is what lies within the boundaries, separating what is inside the discipline from what is outside, what occupies the center and what lies on the periphery. In this schema, then, thinking and imagination describe different ways that stuff is engaged and locations where that engagement occurs. Thinking is the mode of reception for stuff within the known limits, while imagination is required to see the potential in stuff that's outside those limits. The envelope is pushed then when innovation brings outside stuff to the inside, where it is received as new, considered for its utility or fit, and then absorbed or rejected. So this spatial metaphor that I'm talking about emphasizes the movement, though, of the envelope outward rather than the movement of the outside stuff inward. And that's because the determination of what ends up being accepted as architecture will be made by the inside. It will be made as what sticks, what is accepted, what can be absorbed. In other words, the decision cannot be imposed on the discipline by forces outside. So however attractive the shiny new toys it is the discipline in the end that decides which of them gets to be considered architecture. So while informational imagination finds this stuff, it is conformational thinking or even confirmational thinking which ratifies those discoveries and determines their ultimate value. And of course the severity of these distinctions I'm making here is mostly heuristic, overstating it kind of to make the case more clear. Now, there, the distinction is not so uh, uh, complete either because, of course, imagination is also a form of thinking, again, and even the most plodding thought has to look ahead in order to advance. 
and design in particular requires both thinking and imagination to uh, determine and exploit its claim. But in order to navigate that territory, it's necessary for the architect to know where he's located, to know his coordinates on these axes and to be able to tell when he's treading the solid ground of convention and established practice or floating in the nebulous fringe of chance and speculation. In other words, the architect is lost without a compass. And without a compass, it can be easy to mistake the outer reaches of possibility for core truths and values. Such mistakes are possible because architecture, again, as I said earlier, is essentially propositional. Even at its core, where it is theoretically well understood. Every act of architecture takes the architect somewhere, points her in a particular direction, and frames a view. But before this journey begins, the decision to make architecture rather than not, or to make architecture rather than building, must be taken. That is, architecture's elective status, its elective nature, demands that each instance of architecture stand itself as a proposition. A proposition that, since building alone is sufficient, architecture should be rather than not be. This holds as well for every architectural attempt, wherever it falls on these axes that I mentioned. Any architectural act is a particular instance, then, of that most general proposition, which is always first a proposition of architecture. And it must necessarily include, if not feature, the architect's answer, then, to the first question in architecture, which is, of course, then, the question of architecture itself. This has become a question that demands a positive proposition today because the answer is no longer given as it has been for most of architectural history. Through most of architectural history, the architect worked within received traditions and architecture was expected to exemplify well understood conventions. Today, such traditions are history and conventions are boring. Each architect has to figure out the answer then for themselves and demonstrate that answer in each example of their work. In an era when everyone gets an award for participation though, this necessity is often confused for creativity. And the burden of responsibility that comes with architecture's elective status is misunderstood as entitlement. That's because architecture is not immune to the general bias towards novelty and originality in cultural production that holds these days. And this has disrupted the balance of competence and creativity within the field. Thus, native genius and scripted brilliance are credited for unjudgeably idiosyncratic or incomprehensibly complex work, while the simpler remarkableness of its elective presence in the first place is buried in that work's fascination with its own emergent form. Again, even the most novel architecture is first remarkably there. After the novelty has worn off, the presence remains to attest to that elective status and assume responsibility for it. This is another way architecture establishes a necessary relationship to thought and its propositional character. Its definitive, unavoidable public presence makes it always necessarily a community act rather than a selfish enterprise. Architecture's thoughtfulness has traditionally, in other words, been evident to its audience with the implication that architecture meant something to them. Now the most basic obligation of community is to communicate with the corresponding assumption then 
that such communication is trustworthy and intentional. In architecture, this has led at different times to the belief that architecture constituted a proper language, which could be read by the observers at different levels. From a rudimentary awareness of program to an excruciatingly refined awareness of subtle gesture and arcane illusion. This belief is waning today, though, for various reasons. Distaste for the possibility that such meaning might be undemocratically imposed has encouraged a critically undecidable architecture of effects, while the discovery that such meaning is strictly beyond the control of the designer anyway has given impetus to a post-critically disengaged architecture of affect. And yet again, despite this, there it is still. Architecture's continued presence as an answer to the question, asked or not. Architecture is never mute. Despite being crucified for the poor management of meaning, as modernism, or celebrated for denying any responsibility for meaning, as decon, architecture continues to attract interpretation, meaning, and sense. The architect then enters the scene here to supply an answer that architecture itself may not know or even might reject. Just as it is thought that distinguishes architecture from building, it is the thought that imparts value, significance, and, yes, meaning. Now, what architecture does with this thought that distinguishes it from building, that mere building doesn't do, is, quote, place us in our world. This intention, this purpose, this role, consciously pursued or not, is true of all architecture and for each individual architect's version. Further, it stipulates the need for such a version. While the strength of this demand might be challenged, uh, whether it's an imperative or a description, all architectures will exemplify it to some degree. And this plays a substantial role in the determination of the architectural proposition. This formula demands that the world be identified, characterized, understood, such that architecture could place us there by making that world visible. Different architects will distinguish their architectural propositions from each other on this point, finding in their understanding of the world different aspects to emphasize and different ways to grasp them. In short, different worlds to engage. This process can be affirmational or critical. It can be projective or refined. It can bear greater or lesser relation to the world at hand. It can be more or less fantastic, but in any case, in all cases, it will be received by those who are paying attention as an intentional proposition, which the designer must authorize. In the academic context, an architectural proposition is not simply a statement of personal genius, though, but a demonstration of how that genius, the architect's ideas to operate, communicate, to make sense out in the world among other minds. In other words, it's not the ineffable stuff, but the stuff that can be communicated to others, and which therefore necessarily in that communication invites judgment. It invites judgment of its clarity, its rigor, its discipline, etc., and allows it to identify all of the corollary ideas that follow from and fill out that basic proposition. Finally, in that, making it rich enough to sustain a world and provide the fuel for continued exploration and development. What I'd like to do now, then, as I indicated at the start of this talk, is explain my work in this way. Now is when I tell you why the images that have been going by in the background are all the way they are, and to generate for you, from scratch, uh, 
some of the arguments behind the architecture that I've been doing for GASP 30 years. As I said, uh, we no longer work within a received tradition, and each architect is now faced with the need to come up with his or her, her own architecture. While this seems like it would be a tremendous liberation, I feel it is the opposite. I feel that this freedom is being forced on us and thus confers a huge burden of responsibility to get this right, to recognize that this is not a license to impose personal whims on the public for whom the work is being designed, but to try to do for them, who for the most part remain unknown to the architect, what architecture has traditionally done for society when the traditions were received. And that is, again, to place them in the world. Thus, we should approach the design of each work as an expression of a particular understanding of the world. And in turn, we should uh, expect to be able to understand each work that we confront out there in the world as evidence of the architect's belief that this understanding of the world, as exemplified in the work, is the most correct or appropriate. And this, in turn, highlights the intentionality that separates architecture from building. But it puts the architect in the tragic position of trying to do all this for the users, the viewers, the clients, the public, that he or she will never know, without the help, again, of that received tradition that would spell all that world out to those people the world that is supposed to be expressed and embodied in the architecture. So the only thing the architect can depend on then to help him or her live up to this responsibility are care and experience. So if the responsibility is to draw inspiration from the world, to enhance it, to contribute to it, to care and build experience that then is put back into the design then if all that is true, we should expect an architecture to emerge from the efforts of an architect over time, with each project then being an instance of a larger continuing picture, because frankly, the world just doesn't change that quickly. Some architects simply revel in fashion, and they're not, in my opinion, acting responsibly or ethically in these terms. There are also others who claim, in the name of ethics, that, to make each pro that it's most appropriate to make a, each project up fresh in response to the specific requirements of each client. But I think that they are also abrogating a responsibility. In this case, they were abrogating a responsibility to the larger picture and the community beyond the particular client who must also engage the project. Further, even if there is no received tradition, and therefore each project could start over, it seems to me we should be asking why would it? To start over each time, however mindful of the project at hand and its particular requirements, would mean that nothing was learned in the preceding project, which sort of casts that prior project then as a disappointment or maybe even as a failure if nothing is learned from it. So instead, it makes sense to us to build on what was learned before. So then, that finally brings me to the question, what is our world then? How does our work see the world? What should be expressed in our stuff? So the world then, as we experience it, if it's not obvious yet from the slides, is given to us by technology. Again probably pretty obvious from the evidence in the slide so far, but I'd like to show that it's not necessarily or not really so simple an idea, and it's not simply an idea about form. We understand a world with three principal constituents, us, nature, and the objects we make that we place there in the world between us and nature. Everything we experience can be understood as falling into one of these categories. Everything else follows from this initial view. And its reduction 
an axiomatic character then supports the sense that we have of architecture's own fundamental nature, despite or maybe because of its lack of necessity, architecture's necessity, that is. So we call all that stuff we set out there necessarily between us and nature, necessarily in that mediating between us and nature, all the possible products of intentionality, everything that's made, everything that's thought, everything performed, we call all this stuff technology. And each of its instances, each of these objects, are thus, in that sense, to us, machines. Another way to say this, then, is that we think of everything as a machine for something. Everything is out there on purpose or as a result of some other purposes being enacted. Even language is a machine in this sense, as a product of intention. In fact, in the philosophy of technology class that I taught for 10 years at SIAR, I made the case that we owe our very consciousness, our very humanity, to the presence of this externalized intentionality. That is to say, to technology, which is what explicitly and specifically separates us from nature, what distinguishes us from nature. We are human and not natural because of our technology. Now, all sorts of things follow from this basic starting point, including architecture's own position as one of the things we make, there between us and nature as technology. So to view architecture as technology in this way is only partly to say that it is building and thus an example of building technology. To say it is only partly that is to say there is something else also. And this immediately then brings up the question of what kind of technology architecture might be. What might that other thing be? Why it is different or more than just building, which of course is the oldest truism about architecture. And this is where I would insert my definition of architecture. And perhaps surprisingly, given the images you've seen and everything else, it has relinquished the customary connection to building. Instead, and today more generally, I believe that architecture is, quote, a visibly willful expression of medium-specific order that places us in the world. In this more generalizable guise, we can see it in computer architecture or even in fashion, as well as in so many other areas these days that are discovering their own inherent order and trading on that and using the term architecture to describe what they've discovered there. So it's a mark of architecture then that it does not rest on simple embodiment as building would, but makes a statement beyond this then about the way things are or the way they should be. We feel it is architecture's responsibility to the culture to expressively embody this condition the way things are or should be. And it's our responsibility then to architecture to work respectfully with an awareness of its disciplinary boundaries as we go about serving architecture's celebration of that condition. But this is all just our view of things or my view of things. In a situation where there is no received tradition, each of the micro traditions must compete with the others for the rights and opportunities to exist and to do their thing. This casts our preference for the expressively technological as merely one choice among the rest. But we feel, I feel, that this is the most appropriate choice. And I would challenge anyone who says otherwise, which I guess is a general invitation to questions afterward. In a nutshell, then, it's our feeling, my feeling, that technology is the most direct referent. Technology is the quickest and most comprehensive characterization of the human way of being in the world. 
It's the thing, again, that humans bring into the world, and humans do it in their own image. And we cannot help that. So what that means is that the scale of architecture is the scale at which humanity dwells in the world, the scale at which humans experience that world, and the scale at which our senses operate. The scale of the body as an object in space is the scale of a Newtonian reality. It is the scale that has informed our intuition for two million years and formed our common sense. We experience the world as objects in space. We don't need Graham Harmon to tell us that. We have externalized this experience and the understanding that it has engendered as the mechanical or Newtonian orientation to the world. That is, we inhabit the world through our Newtonian mechanical bodies, and this has conditioned everything we know and everything we have known and everything we are likely to be able to know. It is the most fundamental first step in the chain of possible intention that might lead to architecture. This means that if architecture is to embody our place in the world, as well as signify or symbolize it, it will avoid the microscopic or the cosmic. It cannot itself be microscopic or cosmic. It can only be human, which is about this big, and it can only do what can be done at this size. And this means that architecture then, as a body itself, as a projection in some cases of our bodies, is a Newtonian construction, and therefore, in my opinion, properly mechanical. This is unavoidably what it is, so to ignore that in its form or performance, in deference, say, to some conceptual program inspired by amoebas or black holes, is to condemn the result to the simply illustrative or representative, rather than allowing it to be the thing itself. Considered in this way, then, the relationship of the person to architecture is not the usual one of passive contemplation or even um, processional attention. Instead, the architecture is offered as a mechanism to be operated. The more active engagement that results makes architecture more effective as an agent for placing us in our world, which, again, to remind you, is supposed to be what architecture does. That is, architecture is not just entertainment, even though it can be entertaining. In other words, architecture should inspire engaging experience and satisfy that engagement, in my opinion, with operability, tunability, interactivity, involvement. This is a step forward along the traditional trajectory, trading the uplifting sense of projection introduced by the Greeks for a more democratic fact of empowerment. Empowerment is a kind of social buzzword these days, but in architectural sense, it can have real meaning. It can mean the power to affect your surroundings, which is your context, your own world, where you are placed. Implied in this, then, is the importance of a sort of pre-conventional legibility, that is, legibility to everyone, prior to learning any code, uh, any language. It's a kind of legibility that our bodies know directly. And with it comes a quality of expectation in the work, legible in the work, that the work be manipulated by those bodies. So the viewer does not see themselves writ large as in projection via the Greeks, but instead sees themselves in the accommodation or the inflection of the work to their active presence. The work is not a symbol, but a machine to be operated. The work is in this, therefore, also an interlocutor, a companion, a peer. It's neither a toady nor a master, but something with which one converses with which one plays, something which respects your presence as you respect its presence. So 
The viewer reads the work, but more as a guide to its performance and the viewer's active relationship to it than perhaps to its meaning these days, since we have learned from Deacon that meaning is so fraught. And only then does the viewer derive whatever meaning is possible from an appreciation specifically of that mutual performance and the way the work supports that. In other words, the viewer through this interaction becomes a user. The meaning of the work is then not gleaned from contemplation, but like Heidegger's hammer, from use. When the hammer's just sitting there, it's kind of strange. It's kind of an awkward shape. It's sort of hard to relate to. But once it's in action, its weird form becomes clear, and it makes sense even to someone who's never seen one before. Its legibility is important to the effectiveness of that use, but that legibility becomes important, uh, uh, apparent uh, in the use itself. Uh, it becomes an invitation then to use it, but it's not ultimately an end in itself. Again, in use, the legibility is made obvious, but the perp in the purposeful object, that legibility will invite use, will we'll say this is something that uh, you uh, can, can work with. This is something that can fit to you, something you can use. This difference, though subtle, should have effects in the object. It will allow judgments to be made about the real and the decorative, usually to the detriment of the latter, at least from my perspective. It will allow the exuberant expression of real issues to be distinguished from the froth of so much that is decorative or fashionable. Now we found that a major advantage to working with this attitude, with highlighting legibility, is that such a focus is generalizable and portable. It's no good if your architecture only works for houses or museums. The use of different design attitudes at different scales leads to the disjunction and anomie and lack of coherence that characterizes the popular critique of modern society. So this should be a test then for any architecture. How broad is the range of its effective scales? One of the reasons that the architecture derived from Greek and Roman models, what we call classical architecture, was so successful for so long is that its principles could be applied at the full range of scales that mark experience and require design. That is to say, from the doorknob to the city. Classical work was visually, intellectually, and haptically satisfying at all scales and hierarchically coordinated among them. Like the high modern, what we're calling classicism had no blind spots. Classicism was as much a set of principles as a set of forms, though. And the forms themselves had evolved over millennia in support of those principles. In other words, classicism had cooked long enough to cover all the bases and even to anticipate new ones that might arise, which is, of course, how it survived well into the period of buildings that were taller than the orders could stretch and bridges spanning further than the orders could reach. But obviously, hopefully, you can tell from the slides that this is not a call for a return to classicism. Classical architecture is no longer appropriate. The reason that classical architecture is no longer appropriate has nothing to do with the intrinsic merit of its examples, though, but with its reference to a world that no longer exists. The classical values of truth, goodness, and beauty no longer have the force that they once did because the world that they has judged has been blasted and liberated into the present where instead, we seem to be value novelty, difference, and the cool. Now, the reason that classicism was able to evolve over two millennia was that there was a certain continuity in the world it embodied over that period. Such continuity is not apparent now. But this does not mean that we can't look at the work itself for disciplinary technique, even if we do not emulate its particular forms or order. If we can still find value there, then this is an indication that the discipline may outlast any particular culture. 
In fact, maybe that's even what distinguishes a discipline. And this gives some hope for a future for architecture, despite a particular culture in the present that seems less and less interested in it. The takeaway here is that though the possibility of a received tradition is no longer tenable, it seems to me, given all this discussion, that each practice should work as if it were part of such a tradition, or as if it were sponsoring such a tradition. Each practice should aspire to its own classical condition. Each practice should aspire to becoming received someday. It's through this that it earns the right, in my opinion, to be there in the first place and to be foisted upon all the poor innocent people who are going to come into contact with it that have had no say in its design. Now, it probably seems from all this that we only look backwards and have no strategy for an innovation or improvement. Consistency, classicism, harshing on novelty and fashion, it all sounds so conservative. Sadly, an emphasis on thinking first does sort of come off that way these days. So for us, there are two paths to the new then in the face of that earlier discussion. The first path to the new is as a response to necessity. And work that res results from this path is the most convincing for obvious reasons. In other words, we invent when we have to invent, when it's the only way to get something to happen. Thus, such novelty has the requisite sense of necessity about it as its birthright. And this is plainly visible. The second willful path taken by us uh, is when we choose to soup up existing things. That is to say, when we choose to update or improve them in the process. Interestingly, I think most of architectural evolution can be re-explained in terms of this souping paradigm. Because for most of its history, architecture has been less interested in being new than in being good, to uh, uh, borrow from Mies. And the natural path to the good is through improvement of the existing, which is a process very much like the activity of souping something up. Now, the term souping up probably originally comes from enhancing the fuel mixture of a car to make it go faster. But it's come to name the general process of upgrading a jalopy into a hot rod. And we preferred the term souping up to hot rodding. Uh, so souping up forges, souping something up forges a link, though, between the good and the new and creates out of any single example of something souped up a sort of micro-tradition within which judgments of goodness could legitimately be made. Souping up carries a sense of respect, that is to say, for the thing that is being souped up. An upgrade or hot rotting of something wouldn't be bothered with if the original wasn't worth the attention somehow. At the same time, points are awarded for difficulty. So souping up a pacer for example, might be more rewarding in some ways than souping up a Mustang. On yet the other hand, you could say that there's greater difficulty in starting with the Mustang since the original is so strong. The souped up version then has to live up to and hopefully therefore exceed that standard, that super high bar that the Mustang is, is, um, has raised. In our architectural practice of souping, we like to go one step further even and start with a Porsche. A Porsche, an architectural version, like the Farnsworth House or Seagram's building, or Corbu and uh, Charlotte Perrien's Chaise Lounge. These are something that no one would ever dream of messing with. So naturally, that's where we go. As a collateral benefit, this kind of act, souping an icon, carries a hint of humor about it a sort of architectural version of, seriously? <laughs>
Another thing attracts, this is another thing that attracts us uh, to the souping idea, this potential for humor, which again, I hope you see in all the work. But another thing beyond this potential for humor is the way that it diffuses the sense of authorship. And I hope you see that also in all of our work, that there is a lack of personal style or gesture or whim in that. This always leads to questions because every, nobody believes me when I say that. The architect is, in, I claim, the architect is always behind the work rather than in front of it. That is to say that the intended relationship is between the viewer, who in this case has been made a user then, and the work itself, not the architect. Now, since we think of our design as grounded in the specific service of disciplined intentionality and program, broadly considered and loosely defined, rather than any personal whim or idiosyncratic desire, because of that, we can take on then something like the unité as a souping project without it then becoming a contest of personalities. So, in that then, as we want the viewer to relate to the work directly and not reflect on its author, so we address the original works themselves without regard to the author. Now, of course, we are picking originals in all of this work that share some of the same principles, so it is a little easier, I admit that, in this case. As I was saying earlier, another thing that's valuable to us that's interesting about the souping process or the souping strategy is the way that it pays respect to the original by focusing interest on the specific tectonic details of that original that are then taken up in the souping project as a point of reference and a point for potential improvement. Each intersection of elements becomes as important to the souped up model as the overall form. The souping process also expands the time frame beyond the time or presence of the specific physical elements in play at any moment, bringing in relationships to what they were and also suggesting what they might eventually become. So the souped object then is like the moment when the design or diagram process is frozen, yet it also revels in its presence as well as in the referenced duration, the difference that it shows, rather than being uh, apologetic for that preference, that presence as so many uh, examples of versioning um, that also ca capture and embody a process uh, um, demonstrate. Now, despite the hot rods, exceptional air of revolution or critique, its bad boy status or whatever, we believe that work should be exemplary. Work should be offered as an example of the way things should be, not as proof of its own uniqueness. Because of this responsibility, which in many ways is an argument for generality instead of idiosyncrasy, we find ourselves retreating from the more extreme possibilities that any particular design question may present. In fact, here are two short definitions for architecture students that revolve around this idea. First, I believe that architecture is judgment embodied. But I also think that we see architecture as the transformation of constraint into restraint. That is a whole lecture in itself. But every aspect of any project can be subject to this kind of improvement that we're calling souping up in the sense of making it better, or at least perhaps making it more expressive. Teasing out all the implications of the original, particularly those that were originally left unspoken, or those that may even contradict the original's claims. So just as the souping process finds interest in every detail, it can also be applied at every scale, and also reinforces the idea that the architect should stand behind the work rather than in front of it. Any signature that the work then develops through this should happen through its own consistency. And that consistency should be emblematic of a goodness that has been continuously judged through the process of making, proven in each example, 
rather than simply a, a judgment of its difference or its designer's fame. So in closing then, I want to say that every project, however humble, is an opportunity to make a contribution, to think critically and maybe originally about the situation it presents, to reinforce the discipline by showing how it should be done rather than what could be gotten away with or what is most fashionable in architecture at that time. Particularly at this level, there is the opportunity to make a positive case for the understanding of architecture as the conversion of constraint into restraint. Because at this level, the constraints are such that the temptation is always there to take outrageous advantage of every freedom that becomes available. But in such cases, that advantage runs the risk of being stranded out there beyond the budget where nothing else in the project can follow. So that the effect is of an extravagant one-liner, unsupported by its details or materials. One advantage to the smaller scale that has sadly characterized so much of our built work is the extent to which we can actually participate in the construction. Though swinging a hammer, or in our case wielding a welder, is not strictly a part of the discipline of architecture, it is part of the ethos of souping things up. And on many of the smaller projects I've shown tonight, we have actually taken an active hand in the process of construction. This has been both empowering and humbling, which is not a bad mix for architecture itself. And in an age where the virtual, the digital, exerts such a fascination, the sheer weight of a piece of channel dropped on your toe goes a long way towards reminding one of one's own unavoidable meat status which sheer presence is something we share with architecture. And the Greeks, of course, knew that. I think architecture is at a crossroads now, thanks to new technology. And architecture's continuing presence is far from secure. Today, we tend to look at other sources, like Google Earth or Entertainment Tonight, for our place in the order of things. Architecture is, not, is no longer the most important or at least the most influential thing we make. Instead, the movies and other alternative realities tell us how things should be and consume our resources. But maybe, maybe with enough care and precisely at this more humble level, there might continue to be the possibility of engagement possibility that keeps the discipline and its future possibilities alive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there's any question in the audience. There were lots of provocative oh. statements there. Yeah. Many for you to argue against and with. Are all machines metal? No, of course not. Words are machines. I mean, uh, my generalization of technology or machines to everything that we bring into the world, and therefore what separates us from nature, does tend the risk of trivializing the idea beyond something that can be used. But the point of saying that is to make us less fearful of them or um, less uh, 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 narrow in our sense of what they are so that we can understand them as a continuum. Some of the most um, beautiful, expressive, or uh, um, inspiring machines are things that are not metal at all, uh, you know, a, a, uh, or use very little metal, like the um, AC-72s or 45s that you guys may have seen in the Bay in the last America's Cup Challenge. Those are insanely amazing and beautiful machines. Very little metal in there at all. It's all composites and this sort of thing. Um, but again, you know, I would say that uh, uh, words are machines as well. Anything that carries with it a sense of intentionality and purposefulness. This is a distinction that I'm trying, to, that I'm coming to fairly late in our work that some work, some things we make 
have an air of purposefulness about them. They look like they do something, even if you can't tell what they do. They look like they're there for a purpose. They look like they're there for a reason. And in that, they, they invite your curiosity to make you wonder what it is that they do or how it is that they do it or how you can interact with them while they're doing it. Uh, this, I think, is, is, is for me at least sort of where my uh, specific sense of judgment of these things and the machine is going, is to maybe replace a, an obvious and overt um, uh, interest in the mechanical with a, an interest in the sense of the purposeful. So, for example, that Guggenheim-Helsinki competition entry that I showed, which probably uh, inconveniently was being related to, uh, in the ver verbiage, souping up and stuff like that, which it had very little to do with, um, was all about trying to discover in a fairly abstract form, not completely unfashionable, a sense of purposefulness. Why does the thing look like that? What is it doing? Without necessarily revealing that. So another aspect of that to, to kind of further tweak it is um, to consider that what you want to invite is the, just checking the Dodger game, uh, which is probably not anything to say up here. I realize where I am now. Sorry about that, guys. This even year thing didn't work out for you this year. Yes! Because <laughs> I was way more worried about the Giants than the Cubs, I got to say. I should be worrying about the Nats now, but anyway. Any more questions? I wanted to ask, because um, there was this image in Hong Kong of a project, um, and... Yeah, and what I want to understand is how your, um, your understanding of tradition, because it's in a different cultural framework, and how do you make your, what is the agenda for legibility when you operate in a different framework? Like we're all educated in a whole Western tradition, right. and now you've leaped into another framework that you Right. Will, yeah. Well, I will say that at SC, one of my uh, big interests because we have so many inter international students um, is in uh, 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 reigniting a, a, the uh, discussion of uh, critical regionalism, um, taking uh, uh, account of some of the criticisms that were leveled against it back in the 90s when it first came out, mm -hmm. and trying to kind of move beyond that and work with that. In the case of the HKDI project, um, the big circle uh, uh, was uh, maybe not obviously, but supposed to be a reference to the Chinese uh, uh, sense of uh, 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 completion, the world, uh, uh, design perfection, you know, not unlike what we would say in the West about it. But then the divisions in the interior were a way of complicating that and allowing this, the student body and the the school to inhabit that and, and to work with it. And it was supposed to be quite an active um, uh, presence on the interior. And then the uh, bamboo scaffold, you know, screen around the outside was a way to further that, um, that uh, connection into uh, issues of materiality. Uh, to reach back, reach forward, to have, you know, rectilinear within the circle and kind of mix it all up. Uh, obviously, if we had uh, gotten further with that, uh, we would have developed it in, in more detail. I mean, that's a, basically a, s a sketch. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of not exactly a one-liner, but not many more than two or three. Mm -hmm. okay. She said, um, when a sea channel falls on your foot, I think you said that, yeah. humans yeah. are reminded of our meat presence. and. Uh, it's a weird thing. I bought a typewriter, an old piece of junk, IBM 1962, and it, I parked on the hill in front of my house, and it, it fell out on my toe, and it smashed it. It took two and a half years to grow back, and the typewriter's useless. I have, you know, ten computers. So I was thinking about this, and um, what maybe you could s elaborate on. You said, um, God, I have to look at it. A Newtonian construction is properly mechanical. Could you elaborate on that for some of our students? Because I think that's a good one. Well, 
uh, in, in uh, naming the Newtonian, I'm distinguishing between it and, say, the Einsteinian, you know, the idea uh, of um, the, uh, the force uh, mass uh, laws that Newton put in place that actually only work at a certain scale. They don't work at, the mic at this subatomic scale um, where relativistic effects begin to take, take effect, uh, begin to operate, or uh, potentially at cosmic scales where, uh, you know, gravity itself becomes uh, mysterious. Um, but at the scale at which we are in the world, we are objects in space, and the way that Newton first captured that in, equ in equations um, continues to hold. It's not popular, it's not the most cutting edge of our understanding of the universe, but it still holds for the level, the scale at which we occupy the universe, the scale at which we can understand um, reality. And the whole idea of the, of the mechanical is an exteriorization of the way that these objects operate or, or um, the way that such objects operate on each other at this scale in space, how um, uh, uh, you can um, uh, bring purpose into existence. So the point here is, is that if architecture is supposed to place us in the world by making the world visible in ways that it is not otherwise visible, in ways that uh, we take for granted or whatever, the thing that it could do most explicitly in this regard is to make that evidence of the mechanical uh, uh, apparent to us all. The thing that's cool about it to us, too, is that because we are also at that scale and we also operate that way, when you do stuff in, in that spirit, you're, you create an opportunity or an environment in which the conversation between what you're making and the people for whom it is made can occur because you're creating objects that uh, can, en they can engage them, objects can ask them to participate in the manipulation of these objects to tune them. So you're talking about operable windows, you're talking about things that can move. Things like this thing, which I am so upset to see, is obviously now just turned into a bauble or decoration. But once, obviously cruised around here, and you can just imagine that the people that were working in this factory when that was happening would stop, would never get used to that, would stop working and just watch it every now and then as it went by and did whatever it was doing, probably driving some you know, crane um, uh, or hook or something for carrying large, heavy objects around. Anyway, the point is, is that at, at, at that scale, uh, it, it, it becomes most visible, most legible, most therefore engaging when you think of things in mechanical terms. Now, I know that that's not necessarily popular, and a, and a, and a more popular referent nowadays is biology. Um, but I think biology uh, is, a, is a slippery slope, and many of the things that biology lends to us are not so immediately graspable as the mechanical, not so easily legible, not so easy to understand. In fact, um, they get into the realm, you know, that the digital and electronic is, is introducing to us, which is of the magical, where the world, the environment is becoming mysterious again, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but architecture, in my opinion, is not, is not supposed to be mysterious. It's supposed to be uplifting, it's supposed to be inspiring, and it's supposed to be engaging. It's supposed to be something that, again, as I keep saying, places you in the world and makes the world more understandable, or at least your uh, place within that world. And again, my point is, is that, in my opinion, the mechanical, the legibility of things that are mechanical, and again, you know, I'm obviously referencing a certain period of technology here, a certain set of st steel structural shapes, a certain um, a kind of technology in that, um, because I think that that's where uh, the mechanical aspects are most visible without them turning into steampunk or any, anything kind of 19th century and retro. Uh, we hate bolts, for example. Um, I much prefer welding. Uh, because the bolts have become decorative now. The bolts are now a, 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 a feature, a decorative element. They get chromed or whatever and, and lose their, uh, their original purpose. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, is it's all about a question of legibility and, and legibility is the key to engagement 
and engagement is the key to um, uh, living in the world in a much more involved and satisfying way. I actually do have two online questions and then we get to you. Um, should design harmonize with environment around the architecture or those who interact the design, which one is dominant? I can let you read it if you want to read it. Um, I think uh, maybe that is a question about what we used to call contextualism. Should architecture fit in? Um, uh, architecture has an interesting responsibility to fit in and stand out. Um, architecture, in my opinion, needs to be exemplary. It needs to be the seed of a world. Uh, our, I would say about our architecture that architecture um, that it's exemplary of an attitude that says that all architecture wants to be a vernacular uh, of its own. It wants to be um, repeatable. It wants to be emulated. It wants to create a city out of its own form. And I would distinguish between architecture like ours, which I believe could um, uh, make up the fabric of a city because it has uh, a sense of restraint about it, and other architecture like, say, uh, the architecture of monuments like, say, Frank Gehry, where it's hard to imagine an entire city in that form because it's not really interested in creating the fabric, the context, the um, surrounding or in the environment. It wants to stand out apart from that to be the thing that you focus on, the, the highlight of that, uh, that particular environment. I don't think that's particularly appropriate for um, architecture. So I think architecture does have a responsibility to um, to stand out to the extent that it's good enough to be noticed and sustain interest when it is noticed and to therefore be inspiring enough to be exemplary. But in the enactment of that inspiration, that is to say, uh, in the population of the world with other things that it has inspired, it slowly becomes, if not literally background, it, it, it becomes less outstanding. It stands out less in that way. It's, so it's inspirational but not um, a show off. Is, is, I guess, the way I would put it, um, which is not a very elegant way to put it, but hopefully it's, uh, it's understandable. So a uh, quick comment and a two-part question. Um, the comment is the uh, if architecture responsibility is to define place as a very static thing. That sounds like a very nostalgic idea about place, particularly in this day and age. I don't think that's what you intended, but I'm curious as to what your thoughts are. The second part of that is if architecture's, the practice of architecture over a long curve is an iterative act, what are the points of inflection over your career, perhaps as a reflective comment? And then the last part of that is, so what have you learned in 30 years? Okay, what was the first one again? Oh, place. So my, yes, the, Architecture places you in the world. Um, the, the, the sense of placement there is only as static as the world that it uh, invokes in that placement, the world that it uh, represents or embodies or expresses, right? So it's not intended to, when I say place, I don't mean a physical location in space. I mean uh, an act of sense of belonging, a sense of being continuous with or a part of and therefore an ability to have a conversation with and contribute to. I don't mean it literally as a physical placemaking kind of activity. No, 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 I, I mean it more, and, I, and frankly I have thought about, you know, uh, what word could I use instead of place or how could I expand what, you know, how could I uh, unpack the idea of placement here. Um, that seems to me to be uh, something that would be a worthwhile uh, um, in uh, effort, uh, but I haven't done it yet, uh, unfortunately. Um, points of inflection, right? Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I started my career being obsessed with concrete and the Beton Brut and uh, late modern Corbu, Patrick Keating Clay, San Francisco Art Institute. The San Francisco State Student Union, things like that. And then at a certain point, I discovered steel, 
because frankly you couldn't afford concrete in California. Uh, and so I guess that's kind of a point of inflection. Um, following the tectonics, um, the material into the tectonics and finding a new set of icons to try to soup up or um, upgrade or whatever uh, in that. Uh, I think that, uh, actually I would say that almost all the points of inflection, you, you know, which I, uh, in, in the absence of being able to sort of map them out for you through examples in the projects are kind of maybe hard to recall, but I think they would probably be material based. At a certain point, uh, uh, plywood becomes a big deal because that's, you know, what was affordable and so one begins to start thinking about things one can do with plywood and, and that sends the design off in another direction. Um, not trying to be different or novel or whatever, but just asking, you know, like Khan asks his brick, you know, what does plywood like? And then go with that and recognizing the plywood can bend as well as be um, uh, a, a nice uh, stand-in, or at least MDF can be a nice stand-in for steel plate when you can't afford steel plate. Um, anyway, so I think the, that those would be the sort of points of inflection, but I have two parallel practices in a way. I have the architectural practice, but then I also have what I hesitate to call the theoretical practice, but the thinking part, the writing part, which has not always tracked together, despite the way that I have uh, in this talk tonight um, uh, delivered a bunch of words in fairly explicit support of the forms and stuff. I have also tended to um, to go other to follow the words in other uh, places, and and they haven't always uh, uh, connected across in quite the way that I would have uh, uh, hoped. Um, seeing the the words in support of the architecture or the architecture as a way of embodying. Um, or, or bringing to uh, form the ideas in the words. Uh, and I think that um, uh, where those have managed to connect, um, like in this idea of purposefulness, uh, which I'm only starting to, 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 to work out, um, those might be points of inflection as well. In terms of what I've learned, I have to say, there, I think that all architects who care go through three ages that I characterize as Wright, Corbu, and Mies. Um, you come into architecture uh, as a student, as a youngster, knowing only Frank Lloyd Wright, because he's, he's like Arnold Palmer, the golfer, you know. There are certain figures that are the iconic uh, stand-in for that, um, that profession or whatever. So everybody knows Frank Lloyd Wright. Your parents know Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, when you say you want to be an architect, Frank Lloyd Wright what's popped into their mind. And you come into architecture thinking Frank Lloyd Wright is the architect that you're going to emulate. And at Berkeley, uh, we went through this very interesting exercise uh, in the early years uh, of our student careers where we did a project in the manner of Frank Lloyd Wright and another project in the manner of Le Corbusier, uh, which was a total eye-opener to us because we didn't know who Le Corbusier was. And everybody who was cool or good did Frank Lloyd Wright. And all the people who uh, we didn't realize at the time were actually cool or good, did Corbu. And that was a super eye-opening project because, of course, it introduced us to Corbu and the differences in the tectonics and materiality of the two and all that and, and created lots of um, discussions. But anyway, so, so you start out as a super romantic um, uh, individual in the, in the vein of Frank Wright, but then... Um, as you become more sophisticated, as you learn about stuff, as you start taking, uh, caring n less about libertarian ideas of usonia and start thinking about um, the world and sense of architectural responsibility within it, you naturally gravitate toward um, Corbu and become fascinated with him and his story. And there's a lot of nice tragic angst associated with that as well. You know, the, you know, the open hand, uh, the mod modular man, the, the, the you know, the men who say no, you know, the romantic individual who's going to reform um, the world in this um, uh, democratic image where, uh, or universal image where everything could be the same everywhere because of the miracle of uh, HVAC and so forth. And so that sustains you through the, the midpoint of your career. And I don't, I'm not necessarily relating this specifically to form, but just to the attitudes, the way that we think of these characters. And then finally, as you get older, 
and you've been beaten up enough, you enter your Mesian phase. And at this point, you begin to be concerned with details. You begin to be concerned with getting something right. You begin to be concerned with doing something good rather than just being interesting. You begin to have a sense of judgment about what is good and care about that. And you begin to prefer that and make the hard decisions that transform architecture from constraints into restraint, something you wouldn't have done as a younger architect. And so I have, for the last, you know, probably five or six years at least, been entering my Mesian years, my Mesian phase, my dotage. I haven't yet thought about what might happen after that. You know, there, there may be the the senile Frank Lloyd Wright phase, when you start doing all the crazy stuff in Phoenix or whatever that that you don't really want people to know about, that that you know your people in the office have to excuse or whatever. But I don't know yet. Hopefully, I'm not there. Thank you. I, is there any other question? I'm, I I feel like we already took a lot of your time. For the what am I? Gonna, what else am I going to do? Yeah, but <laughs> at the same, you have. There are more questions. <laughs> I want to ask that California Unite project, is that in any way related to the subversiveness of your thesis? That was my thesis. Oh, that is. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, I actually, it, sure. I, I, I should call it the diversite, because that's what my thesis was actually called. Uh, uh, my, my question is a little bit related to my entry point where I, when I when I first saw your work I was like well this was like a revelation at the time and now 25 years later I Thank guess you. I'm <laughs> from my point of view at least um, <laughs> you just said classical is um, classical is about a time that no longer exists and we live in a time where technology is is moving so rapidly and I feel like the mechanical is at the brink of probably no longer existing pretty soon. So, and, and I don't want to take this into the biology statement you made earlier because I don't think that's, that's, that seems to me more like a fashion, fashion trend right now, or sure. not right now, but in the last 20 years maybe. So, so do you have a stance on where your work would move from there in relation to your stance on technology and the human body? It would be interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, Again, I would generalize from the mechanical to this notion of purposefulness and legibility uh, that what I'm, what I'm most fearing in the uh, advances of technology is getting to a point where things become mysterious and hidden and magical again, where everything happens for us. We enter a push button phase where we have no idea how to fix a car, how cars work. We have no idea you know, how to make the, you know, the building warm or cold. You know, we lose contact literally with our environment through this because everything happens for us. We turn into those fat blob people in uh, Wally, you know, because we have no idea how to do anything or uh, uh, how anything is done. And so this is also part of the idea that architecture um, converts constraint into restraint. We have spent 2,500 years in architecture uh, pushing against constraints like gravity and, um, and uh, other technological uh, issues. Um, and now we are being liberated of those constraints, but we're still operating within a kind of a spirit of uh, pushing against them. And, the, and, and what I fear is that um, after spending 2,500 years having to be ingenious about how to do that, now we're inventing materials that can do it without any apparent effort whatsoever. I mean, soon enough, nanotechnology will allow buildings to hover above the ground. I mean, it won't matter. You'll be able to do anything you want, and so the question is gonna occur, how do we decide what to want, what to do? This is where the crisis in the discipline exists, I think. And so, uh, this is, and this is where, therefore, I'm general, I'm, I'm general, I, I am moving from the specific interest in the mechanical to the more general interest in the sense of purposefulness. What is that sense? How do we communicate that? How do we relate to that? How do we create an environment that we can react, interact with beyond simply just pointing and having stuff appear on a screen or whatever? 
or gesturing and having the temperature come down or the lights go up or whatever, um, trying to regain, retain the sense that there is a, there, there's a sun, you know, and you have, say, for example, sun shades that you can close and open like louvers, and then the sun comes in or the sun stays out, and you can get it. You can see it rather than some kind of magical diachroic film or whatever that just goes opaque. How did that happen? I mean, I, wouldn't you consider that classical if you if you approach it from that angle? Which it's almost like yeah, the the the, the non-virtual, the actual act of the mechanical, like the louvers, wouldn't that be considered classical in that? Direction? Yeah, but again, classical is not a dirty word to me. The only reason I said classical didn't apply is because of the value system that it um, entailed. The the idea, the triumvirate of truth, goodness, and beauty, all interrelated. And the relationship beyond that to a, uh, you know, a deistic understanding of, of the world, you know, God and all this kind of stuff, you know, no, no longer seems to be operating in the same way for us because now uh, our values are more about, you know, novelty and coolness and, and potentially performance, let's say, things like that. In fact, you could take truth, goodness, and beauty or commodity, firmness, and delight and replace them with... Uh, I have it on my desktop here somewhere. Uh, uh, affect, effect, and reflect um, as uh, three ways to think about how we relate the, the environment to our, our, values, our cultural value systems now. So the cultural value systems that supported and, and, propagate and, 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 um, and were in turn supported by classical architecture don't happen anymore. You know, we're too cynical uh, uh, we don't believe, you know, uh, beauty is kitsch, you know, truth is suspect, and goodness, you know, give me a break. Seriously, you know, we don't, we don't believe that either. So we have other values now. That's why I'm saying classicism no longer works. But we can learn from that. It, 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 particularly the sense of it knitting together at all scales. So there was a continuity uh, in the universe. You could design a, 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 a doorknob in the same system that would, would design a whole city plan and they would go together and they would feel consistent. There wasn't a kind of disconnection or um, uh, incoherence that seems to occur now where we've got one set of principles or ideas governing the design of little things and another designing the, governing the design of medium-sized or large things because we have a fragmented culture. You know, that changes week by week or uh, corner of the internet by corner of the internet. And I, you know, again, I'm not saying that necessarily that we're, that's ever going to get repaired and all come together again. So we're all living in this unified world. Um, but I think we can generalize again. This idea of purposefulness doesn't have value associated with it, other than a sense of contribution. You know, a sense of you know, which is a positive sense. I think a sense of um, uh, uh, production let's say, you know, in a positive way rather than destruction. You know, that's about all that we can probably agree on, you know, as a society now. <laughs> well, you, go ahead. I think, Keith, do you have, Keith, you had another question earlier? No? If there are no, well, if there are no more other questions, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you.